Winston Churchill once said that Russia is a riddle wrapped inside a mystery, wrapped inside an enigma. And in today's episode, we're going to try to uncover some of that mystique by exploring the historical capital city of Moscow. Welcome to another episode of Virtual World Tours, where we take you around the world virtually, helping you visualize places you've never seen before while bringing you some interesting facts and stories along the way. Today, I'm really excited because we are in Moscow. Uh, we are in a Cessna private jet. Um, you can see it has the nice little Russian paint job on it. And uh, let's take a look, quick look at the interior before we take off. Really cool. If you look back here, you can see it's really cozy. So grab your friends, grab your cats, and let's take a little uh, fly around Moscow together. And let's go ahead and take off here. Yeah, Osaka's excited, right? I think she might just sleep during this flight. So we are taking off from Sheremetyevo Airport and going to Domodedovo Airport. So this is going from northern Moscow into southern Moscow. Um, Sheremetyevo Airport is where Aeroflot is hosted. Um, that's one of Russia's biggest airlines. But let's go ahead and, and take off here. I had the privilege of visiting Russia in 2015, um, both Moscow and St. Petersburg. If you want to really get a Russian feel for what Russia is like, especially the old historic Russia, the Soviet Russia, you got to go to Moscow. St. Petersburg is great, but it's got a more modern European feel to it. We have clear skies here, but that's not usually the case in Moscow, so we will see later what it looks like just kind of in a snowy, hazy environment as as I experienced and how many have experienced when they've gone there. So what we're going to do in this flight as we go just to the airport on uh, the other side of the city is explore the city through the river. Now, the Moskva River is the river that flows through Moscow. Any kind of historic and important city has a river that flows through it. Geopolitically and economically, the river is important both for the movement of people and the movement of goods. And as we'll talk about later with Peter the Great, um, who I'm going to profile a bit later in this episode, uh, access to the sea became very important for Russia, both in the time of the Tsar and Peter the Great and during the Soviet times. So as we're looking at here, you see this waterway down here. This is the Moscow Canal, actually, which connects the Moskva River to uh, many seas nearby. So I think the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, um, which I think the Baltic Sea eventually leads into the Atlantic. First sight that we're going to see is a stadium here, the home of Spartak Moscow, a stadium that was used during the 2018 World Cup. So you know what? Let's take a pause here and let's just explore because this is pretty cool. I don't know if a plane has ever been inside of a stadium like this. Certainly not this stadium, but let's just see what we can do here. Oh, that's pretty cool. The developers um, who, who kind of built these buildings in Moscow did a good job because that's, that's pretty cool. I think I can go right through it, though. Yep, just go right through the stadium. All of Moscow, as you can see, you can see a lot of the... Soviet style apartment blocks which were built during the Stalinist era and the Soviet era. So coming up here, our, our first kind of main part of the city that we're going to see is the Moscow International Business District. So this is this cluster of skyscrapers here. If you looked at this area of Moscow, let's pause coming up here. I'm not sure I could ever fly a private plane like this like just through Moscow. It'd be kind of crazy. Um, if you kind of looked at this area of Moscow, 10 to 15 to 20 years ago it wouldn't these buildings i think weren't even here this is definitely a post-soviet era thing let's change our settings here to kind of just look around as its name kind of implies it is kind of an international financial district now um you know it's kind of one of those places i went out around here at night and it was very there's no one around at night i think it's just really a compute a commuters area I really like this golden building. I mean, that's pretty cool to have the emblem of Russia on the top of a skyscraper there. But as we'll see as a theme of Moscow, um, just kind of the intersection of East versus West. Um, so we'll hear that 
when I profile Peter the Great later, how he tried to bring the West um, back to Russia. And then um, obviously the whole Soviet experiment was about being able to be independent from the West, being able to kind of build our own society here in Russia and our own powerful nation here in Russia without interaction with the West, which ultimately failed. And ultimately many people that I met in Moscow have a fascination with the West, especially Germany and America. It's just super interesting that um, they try to kind of build their own political ideal and economical ideal, but then they look over to the capitalist and say, hey, we want your like oranges and avocados. Can you please ship those here? Uh, but anyway, I, I kind of digress. Let's continue along our route here. And I need to slow down because I'm going way too fast here. We see the first of the Moscow Seven Sisters. So these buildings were built, you know, let's just go into free flow mode here. I think it's just easier. These are Stalinist uh, buildings built. Um, you can see kind of the, the emblem there at the top. So there's seven of these around Moscow. They're kind of uh, very daunting, imperial looking buildings. I think now this is a hotel and this one over here is an apartment complex for rich Russians. Well, this is, I think is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Let's just go take a look. Um, so I think this is still the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, which kind of conducts the relations with other countries. But these were the skyscrapers, if you will, at the time of the Soviet era in the middle of the 20th century, because these other skyscrapers certainly weren't there. So there's central Moscow right there, but we're gonna just take the river, the river route. Oh no. All right, I can't, I can't afford to crash here. Right. Can we just slow down, please? How you doing? Are you sleeping? I think she's sleeping. I think she likes. So let's just continue along our river route because that's kind of the theme, both the importance of rivers and waterways and the uh, interaction of east and west. We're coming up here on another one of the Seven Sisters, Moscow State Uni University, maybe the fam most famous of the Seven Sisters. A really cool building. I took a walk around here. Um, so this is, I think, you know, basically the top university in Russia. I uh, met a couple of locals who went there, um, including Svetlana. Shout out to you, Svetlana. Um, she went there and she's kind of told me about her experience of, of going here. She even wrote her thesis on Leninism and how it uh, works in society today. Even though the Soviet Union fell, Russia and Moscow have not let go of the political, socio-economic ideals that they had um, with Marxism, Leninism, communism. Look, this isn't this isn't going to be a lecture about those different political and economic ideas, but. Um, it's still prevalent in Russia today. One anecdote I have is that when I was there in 2015, it was the 70th anniversary of World War II ending and really Russia ending World War II. So I met several Russians who said, hey, who won World War II? And I was like, the Americans won World War II. And then they laugh my face off or they laughed their face off because um, their idea is that Russia really won that war um, they're really proud of it, and I'll put up a picture here, but they even had kind of huge murals celebrating the Soviets' victory in 1945 um, over the Germans. And it's just really ironic because now a lot of the Russians I met in 2015 wanted to escape to America, but it's hard to get to America, so it's easier to get to Germany so they even wanted to get to Germany. So it's just ironic that the country that you're still so happy that you are you defeated in a war is actually the place that the average person kind of wants to escape to. Up here is basically the National Stadium of Russia, if you will. At one time it was called the Lenin Stadium. Um, this hosted the World Cup final in 2018. It also hosted a lot of important events during the Soviet era. Um, but as you can see, it has a prominent position here in Moscow, right along the river. So we're starting to really enter the central part of Moscow now. So right here to the right is Gorky Park. And so we're going to stop right up here. Let's go into free mode right now. Oh, wow. 
I don't know where this took me, but it took me to just a random street. Looks Soviet to me. Okay. So right here into the entrance of central Moscow, um, you see the river diverges here for just a little bit. But right here you can see this is, I'll include a picture. This is Peter the Great here on this statue. So now let's uh, take a short moment to learn a little bit about Peter the Great and what he meant to Russia. Peter Alexievich was born in 1672, a son of Tsar Alexis, ruler of all of Russia. At birth, Peter was an unforeseen Tsar, as he had older brothers who should have taken the throne before him. But the unlikely death of his brother Fedor, and the illness of his other brother Ivan, led to the Russian nobility choosing him to co-rule with his mother beginning in 1682, when he was just 10 years old. However, young Peter was uninterested in royal duties, preferring to explore carpentry, work in shipyards, and hang out with Westerners in Moscow's German Quarter, and his half-sister Sophia was the de facto ruler. As many of us travelers can empathize with, Peter developed a dislike of his home city, Moscow, and its locals' politics and customs. He hoped to get time away. In 1697, when he entered his late 20s, now the lone czar of Russia, Peter embarked on a grand embassy to Western Europe where he and a group of Russian royalty spent more than a year touring around England, the Netherlands, and other areas, developing relations with Western countries, learning how to build ships and sail the sea, and having fun, eating and drinking all the delights of European food and drink, and even taking European mistresses. This time in Europe proved to drastically change Peter's life and the type of ruler he would be for Russia. When he returned to Russia, where he would rule for another 25 years, he instituted a series of reforms that proved to be unpopular among the traditionalists in Moscow. Most importantly, he established a Russian navy, ensuring Russia would hold world power for centuries to come, and established a port city along the Baltic Sea, now named St. Petersburg, after Peter the Great. He even made St. Petersburg Russia's capital, until it was later returned to Moscow. Peter's other reforms included bringing aspects of the European Enlightenment back home. He encouraged Russians to adopt Western clothing and encouraged men to shave their beards. He revolutionized the Russian diet, importing the likes of wine and potatoes and tea and coffee. And among other things, he banned arranged marriages and secularized schools. But all of Peter's actions couldn't be considered enlightened or good. Like many autocrats, Peter harshly punished those who disagreed with him even killing his own son, his heir, who didn't agree with Peter's reforms. Always a heavy drinker, Peter died in 1725 at the age of 52. Russia in Peter's time wrestled with some of the same questions Russia struggles with today. Can Russia be a strong, independent empire with its own political and economic system and be one of the world's most powerful countries? Or must Russia integrate further with the West and give up some of its autonomy in order to continue to have a thriving society, both politically and economically. The answer for Russia has never been easy, and even today, though he is remembered for the good he did, Peter the Great is a somewhat controversial figure in Russian history. So as we continue along the Moscow River, dang, I'm going so fast. You have the Cathedral of Christ our Savior. Which is one of the most famous sites in all of Russia. Eastern Orthodox Church has historically had a lot of influence in Russia. Um, but during the Soviet era, they did not like the church. It was all about atheism and kind of against the church, but they didn't destroy every church. So for example, St. Basil's in Red Square, which we'll see here in a little bit, was basically just turned into a museum. Um, but Cathedral of Christ our Savior was rebuilt after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990. Um, so if you can just imagine, and I'll try to include a picture, this whole area. Oh, you're awake now. Hello. This whole area right here that you're looking at was turned into an outdoor swimming pool. And so it's really interesting because 
I was reading an old National Geographic that I got from my grandparents' house from 1966. Super interesting about kind of an American traveling to Moscow. But this whole area was turned into a swimming pool. And so this, this National Geographic describes of how it could be snowing and, you know, below zero temperatures. But this huge swimming pool was heated. And so um, it was like the biggest swimming pool in the world. And Russians would just come here and swim. Um, and so that's an example of how a, a religious site was removed and turned into a, a public space where people came and swam, even in the cold Russian winter. Yeah, you want to go swimming? I don't think you do. She really hates baths, by the way. And then right here is the Kremlin. So you can see the red, the red walls uh, around the Kremlin. This is obviously the central uh, government area of Russia. Um, I went on a tour there. It was super cool. You can even as a foreigner, you can go on a tour into the Kremlin. Um, I'll include a couple of pictures if I can. And then coming up here is Red Square. So you can see right here is Red Square. So up here, this is just a museum, a really cool museum. They have a mall, I believe, over here. And then um, I'll include a picture, but it's just a really open space. I think in the Soviet area, they had parades here with military vehicles. And then obviously here, the Kremlin. And this is one of the biggest um, kind of towers of the Kremlin. And then they have uh, basically where Lenin is buried. You know, during the Russian Revolution, he was kind of the hero of that. So you can see this right here. And that is basically the Russian word for Lenin. But when I went to Russia, I learned the Russian alphabet. So it's just interesting because it looks super cool. Basically, it's not too hard to learn if you're an English speaker. Um, you just got to replace a couple of the letters. It's interesting because even today, Lenin's body is embalmed in that area. And I didn't go in there, but you can still kind of go take a look at Lenin's body. He, he died in the, I believe, in the early 20s, 1920s. They kind of continue to upkeep on his body. The Russian ideal of who we want to be as a nation is a little bit wrapped up in their idea to preserve this body of this man who had these ideas that kind of determined um, who they were going to be. And they haven't let yet let go of that. This is St. Basil's Cathedral here. Again, one of the most famous sites. I'm sure you've seen a little picture of this. It was built, I think, in the middle, in the 1600s or something like that really cool area of Moscow. Um, being there as an American was really cool because you kind of feel like you're in this forbidden place, really, right? Where all this history took place. As an American, you know, you shouldn't have been there. This kind of just kind of gets the point home of of what Russia might look like when you visit. A lot of snow, a little bit when I visited there, as an American, and usually you can kind of travel wherever without thinking about it, but the the visa process is you have to fill out like a very long form, you have to send it in, you have to have like a hotel that sponsors you. Um, and then I remember the, the passport, the guy at passport control was like looking at me, the Russian dude was like, why, why are you here? But it's really interesting to kind of see people who were there. Um, again, they were really interested to meet me. A lot of times I was the only American they had ever met. So imagine just a lot of young Russians meeting me. It's like I'm a little ambassador for America, right? And they're really excited to meet me and learn about what America is like. To be quite honest with you, I met I met a lot of, I mean, not a lot, but I met a few women who came on pretty strong because it was almost like they um, wanted a way to get to the West and I was a way for them to kind of escape their current life and get to the West. So I almost got a couple of marriage proposals. Unfortunately, I had to let let people down there, but, and I didn't necessarily feel unsafe at all. Um, if you're kind of kind of navigate around, you have to know, I had to learn a little bit of the Cyrillic alphabet. So we're going to the other big international airport there. This is the one I originally flew into. But even though Russia today is a less powerful country, both politically and economically, than it was during the Cold War era, um, it's still obviously a huge part of the world, um, still has pretty large influence over a lot of people in the world. I think the population is something like 
120 or 150 million, something like that. Really interesting place, and it's all centralized here in Moscow. All right, so I'm nearing 800 feet here. Okay, I mean... <laughs> Not the greatest landing, but hey, I guess I was going slow enough. Thanks for joining me on, the ep on this episode of Virtual World Tours. Hope to see you next time. Let me know where you'd like to go next. Please like and subscribe and comment. See you later.